This is an RNZ podcast. Kia ora, I'm William Ray. Welcome to Black Sheep. So, I have a problem. My problem is that I don't know if the story you're about to hear over the next 20 minutes or so is true. It's a World War II conspiracy wrapped in a mystery inside a hoax, but we don't have any smoking gun evidence, and you could argue that pretty much everyone involved has some reason to lie. And the underlying story is just ridiculous. It's so ridiculous that when I was halfway through reading a book about this story, I stopped and walked up the road to Victoria University's library and asked to see their archives so I could read some of the source material firsthand. Yeah. I sort of imagined it being dustier. <laughs> sort of like the forbidden section of Harry Potter or something. No. Dust is our enemy. <laughs> okay. Alright, I found the thing I was looking for. So, this is a letter from Kenneth Folks. He was a major, he was the head of the Security Intelligence Bureau in 1942. I'll just read you a bit of it. After many weeks' observation and surveillance, the following plan emerges. Immediately prior to the invasion, which is confidently predicted within the organisation, counterfeit money is to be circulated, rumours disseminated, waterworks, tunnels and viaducts to be destroyed, the assassination of important ministers is freely discussed between the parties as the culminating factor in the destruction of public morale as a basis for successful invasion. And that's addressed to the Right Honourable Peter Fraser, Prime Minister of New Zealand, Wellington. <sighs> Can't believe this really happened. I just, it's, it's so crazy. In case you didn't follow that, I'll summarise. Major Folks, the head of New Zealand's first real spy agency, the Security Intelligence Bureau, is telling the Prime Minister that Nazi agents have infiltrated New Zealand. He says they've established a network of saboteurs and are planning on blowing up critical infrastructure and assassinating top-level politicians. He says this plan will kick off within the next few weeks unless the Prime Minister declares a kind of martial law, allowing his special agents to arrest these conspirators and hold them without trial. The thing is, it's not real. It's all lies, and major folks very nearly use these lies to suspend the rule of law in New Zealand. The big question is, did he know he was spreading lies? Or was he sucked in by a hoax, by a very clever hoaxer? The story starts at the gates of Waikiria Prison with a man called Sidney Ross. Large family, I think he was the son of a blacksmith, and um, there were girls and there were boys, and the girls all turned out very proper and law-abiding, and the boys um, were were the ones who liked getting up to mischief, and one of them was quite rough and had serious um, offences against the law involving violence. Sid wasn't like that, he just liked getting away with things if he could, and that that was the way he saw himself, as a clever guy who could get away with things. That's Beverly Price. She and her late husband, Hugh Price, researched and wrote an excellent book about the Sid Ross hoax called The Plot to Subvert Wartime New Zealand. As Beverly said, Ross's crimes often had a flair for the dramatic. He had a background in amateur comedy theatre, and he seems to have put his acting chops to work both in crime and in everyday life. One time he posed as a pro-boxer to scam money, and while he was in prison, a fellow inmate said he would tell stories that he was getting personal letters from Hitler. Ross told me something about being in Hitler's pay. He was getting sealed letters into the prison from Hitler or his agents. He didn't actually say what the letters contained, but he gave me an understanding that if Hitler came into power in this country, he would be one of the heads, and he would get me a job as one of his secretaries. On another occasion... Ross told me that when Hitler came into power, he would get all the officers of the prison and mow them down. He would have them all lined up and shot. Perhaps that Hitler story was a sort of dress rehearsal for his next big scam. It's a scam he seems to have planned with another inmate, an older man called Alfred Remmers. Remmers was a policeman. Mm. He was a policeman in the UK. He came to New Zealand 
and joined the New Zealand police and next thing he was uh, dismissed because he he committed a crime, burgling places uh, while he was on the beat. He's essentially the, the brains behind the idea, but he's a man who's sadly dying. Uh, within a very short time, he's dead of leukaemia, and uh, he's in need of some con man to uh, do the legwork, which is exactly what Ross did. That's Sherwood Young. He's a retired police historian who wrote about the Ross and Remmers scam for the Dictionary of New Zealand Biography. The first thing Ross does after he gets out of prison in March 1942 is phone up the Minister of Public Works, Bob Semple, and tell him a truly astonishing yarn. It's so astonishing that he's taken to meet the Prime Minister, Peter Fraser, so he can hear the whole thing in person. The story's pretty much as was described in that letter we read out in the beginning, a conspiracy to prepare the way for a Nazi invasion. Ross says he's been approached to take part because he has experience with explosives from using them to break open safes. And Ross was started off with utter honesty and saying, look, I've, I've just been released from Waikiria pr- prison and I'm an expert in bl- blowing things up and they thought I could be useful. But I'm an honest New Zealander and I wouldn't, in the middle of the war, I wouldn't be prepared to um, undermine the New Zealand war effort. Mm. So his way of, um, of handling his hoax all along was a, a mixture of what was true and verifiable and of course the fantasy that there was a that that there were conspirators around trying to get in touch with him which is always the key to a good hoax isn't it is that there's enough that's true in there that that's right so people are confused and think oh well it must be true because of so and so so when Semple said to him um well you know why didn't you go, go to the police with that he said well the police wouldn't believe me (laughs) <laughs> because they know that I've um, I've fooled them on other tried to fool them on other occasions, so they they wouldn't. That's why I came straight to you people, and it's most important," said 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 Ross, "that you don't inform the po- police because you'll come up against exactly the same entrenched attitudes that I'm not I'm not an honest man." Now, this story might well have ended there, with Semple and Fraser dismissing Ross as a con artist. But the Prime Minister knew something that Ross had no way of knowing. He'd just found out that a conspiracy very similar to the one Ross had described had been uncovered in Australia. In fact, that real conspiracy was on the front page of the Evening Post just days after Ross came forward. Treason plot. Australian arrests. Revelations of a sensational nature were made by Australia's Minister for the Army, Mr F. M. Ford, in the House of Representatives, dealing with the arrest of 19 men and one woman, believed to have been associated with the so-called Australia First movement. Investigations concerned with the arrests had revealed the existence of a treasonable conspiracy to help the Japanese if they invaded Australia. Documents had been seized which set out plans for the assassination of leading Australians and for sabotaging vulnerable points. So, understandably, Fraser took Ross's story of a New Zealand sabotage plot extremely seriously, and they put him in the hands of major folks who'd recently been sent out from the UK to run the newly formed Security Intelligence Bureau, SIB for short. But folks has an agenda of his own. He's not particularly happy with how the intelligence services run in New Zealand, and he wants extra powers similar to those recently introduced in the UK under Defence Regulation 18B. He came out from England with a very good understanding of the new security regulations that came in 1939-1940 when Britain needed to round up all sorts of aliens and suspicious people. And so he seems to have seen this as a chance to get more power, basically. Yes, indeed, yes. Um, And, of course, his department, if it was going to do all this rounding up, would have to be far, far bigger. So it was a, a power grab that he was contemplating, and he would have convinced himself that it was for the best of possible reasons um, for, for patriotism and saving and saving New Zealand. Folks has a vested interest in Ross's story turning out to be true, and surprise, surprise, very shortly after meeting Ross, he sends a letter to the Prime Minister which reads like this. Sir, 
With regard to the meeting I had with you on Sunday afternoon, investigations prove that the story we heard has substance. The matter is developing slowly and is leading to a clique already under notice. Further developments will be reported to you immediately. Now that is a very interesting letter. Because what are these investigations he's talking about? What is this clique that's already under notice? We know Ross's story is fake, so how can folks possibly have corroborated it? Do you think, I mean, do you think, because I I sort of struggled with, with this throughout the book, do you think that folks genuinely believed there was something to Ross's story, or do you think he knew from the start that it was all lies? I have no idea. I have no idea. But I think he was... He was told from the beginning by Ross and Semple and the Prime Minister that that Folkes was not an honest man. Regardless, Sid Ross is sent up to Rotorua, which he says is the epicentre of the secret Nazi network, and told to go undercover and find out more. He was absolutely delighted that his story was was um, was believed, and he was given an, an alias. He was captain quarter of the Merchant Marine. He was given unlimited money. He was told to well, you've got to act like um, captain quarter of the Merchant Marine, whose ship is in, uh, being repaired somewhere. Which is a big step up from Waikaria Prison. It was a big, <laughs> but it was right up Ross's alley. And as you can imagine, with the discomfort of being in Waikaria Prison, right in the cold of the isolation mm. and aus- uh, in the middle of the North Island of New Zealand, a life of austerity and lack of dignity, suddenly staying in the best hotel in Rotorua, mm. having life of Riley. To Beverly, this whole setup seems deeply suspicious. Why did Ross need an alias? After all, he claimed the Nazi agents already knew his real name. What would they think when they saw this man who they'd contacted suddenly appearing with all the money in the world... I mean, they would immediately tumble to it. So why did he say that he had to pretend, go on pretending to be a conspirator? Mm. He, you, I mean, you couldn't do both at the same time, could you? Mm. But that, that, that was a hole in Ross's story that nobody seemed to have, uh, to have thought suspicious. Mm. Even if folks was running an incompetent um, security organisation, he would have tumbled to that. So the only thing that allows the story to hang together is he wanted to provide evidence to persuade Fraser that there was a real plot. While Ross, a.k.a. Calder, was living it up in Rotorua, he was also gradually expanding his hoax. It'd go a bit like this. Ross would head out in the morning and go for a drive around Rotorua, maybe took a look at the geysers or the mud pools. Sometimes he'd head further afield, up to Auckland, to visit his mum or some old mates. While he's out and about, he'll see a shopkeeper. He goes back and reports to the SIB agents that so-and-so shopkeeper is a conspirator. He's got a mole on the left side of his nose. He tends to wear a leather jacket, etc., etc. The SIB agent then follows up the next day and confirms the details. Yes, that's the guy. He's got the mole in the jacket. Ross also introduces Remmers into the scam. He claims Remmers is the mastermind of the conspiracy and gets him to write out a list of conspirators in his handwriting to hand over to the SIB. The SIB then write up all this evidence in big binders. One day, Ross is called in for a meeting at SIB headquarters, and while he's there, he flicks through these binders and sees something very interesting. Calder, or Ross, now saw the compendium for the first time and flicked through it because he was very interested. These these were his stories. But to his horror, he saw things that he didn't know about and he returned at once to look at it more carefully because what he saw was so astounding. Good grief, how could this be? The books contained his inventions in full, all his visits to pretended subversives and the detailed accounts of his supposed conversations with them were there all right but these genuine calder notes comprised only about a third of the entries and the other two thirds had been added by other hands so what ross says has happened is that the sib was sneakily adding details to his fake story to make it more convincing Unfortunately, these binders have since vanished, so we don't have any smoking gun to prove Ross's story one way or the other. 
What we do have are the letters folks wrote to the Prime Minister saying the SIB is convinced the Nazi conspiracy is real. He's also constantly pressing Fraser to grant the SIB extra powers. At times he takes on an almost threatening tone. If it is decided not to take on the powers, then may I respectfully say that while the most strenuous endeavours will be made to prevent the plan being carried into effect, I could not undertake complete responsibility in that connection. I am constrained to say this because I am satisfied that we are dealing with desperate men. Unfortunately for folks, and for Ross, the whole hoax is about to unravel. Because almost from the moment Ross arrived in Rotorua, the local police were suspicious of this Captain Calder. He stuck out like a sore thumb having a car and, and petrol. And he was noted by the police sergeants on the beat in Rotorua. If the first time he was picked up, it was for driving on the wrong side of the road. I mean, he wasn't, he wasn't doing anything to act in a surreptitious way. So then they started asking questions, and then an astute police constable realised that the face of the man was exactly the same as the one in the police gazette. And when they confronted him with the information is that you're, you're not Captain Calder, you're, you're um, Sidney Ross. And Sidney Ross didn't deny it, but he, he said, but you can't arrest me because I'm working for the uh, SIB and it's very important work I'm doing and so on. So there was, uh, I think, a couple of weeks um, of um, coming and going between the police and the um, trying to check on his credentials and so on before the thing really properly blew. Peter Fraser is also suspicious. He asks a police detective, Jim Cummings, to take a look at the evidence the SIB's put together on the supposed Nazi plot. It seems to me that Fraser said to Jim Cummings, have a look at this, tell me what you think. And Cummings says, well, Prime Minister, I don't believe this story, and I certainly doubt it's Ross's story. I've read the five volumes. This whole thing's been blown right out of proportion, and I'm looking squarely at... at uh, folks for it. This, together with Ross's anxiety over the fake extra evidence, seems to panic the SIB into taking drastic action. They thought that if it could be demonstrated that now Calder's life was in danger because of this um, this bumbling behaviour by the New Zealand police, well then perhaps Fraser would, would, would realise that he, it was a real plot. They were trying to make, trying to prove that the plot was real. And the way to prove that the plot was real is that the fifth column chaps had turned on Calder. So Ross, all by himself, um, gets a wet rope, rubs it over his back to make it look under medical eyes as if he'd been assaulted by someone and whipped and thrashed about. And then came living out without his jacket and, you know, with his, with his wounds and said someone was making an attempt on his life and the SIB were to be contacted and so on. So he, he did this, he acted his socks off for two or three days, but he knew, <laughs> but he wasn't. And the police don't seem to have fallen for it for a second. They immediately thought the whole thing was suspicious. Well, of course they did. I mean, from the, from the moment that they, that they started um, to make notes on the strange behaviour of, of Ross pretending to be Calder in Rotorua. I should stress again that we don't know for sure that this whole faked torture thing was the SIB's idea. Ross claimed it was, but he's not exactly a reliable source. Ross was taken into police custody and had a final few meetings with a couple of SIB agents called Meikle and Brooker, who he says told him to lie about the whole story. Here's what Ross says happened in a confession he eventually gave to the police commissioner. On Captain Meikle's arrival, I asked him what the bloody hell was the game. He said for me to simply stick to the story in the volumes and nothing would be done. Meikle and Brooker spent from 6 o'clock to 3 in the morning talking of just what attitude I was to adopt with the police. They told me to stick it out till 12 noon and then they would call me and say they were arresting me under the military law and would take me to Auckland where I'd be released and the whole thing would be finished with. But the SIB never front. Ross realises the game is up and decides to spill the beans to the police. He confirms the police's suspicion that his initial hoax was swept up into a much wider SIB conspiracy. This leaves the police and the government in a sticky situation. They can lock up Ross for his part in the hoax, but what are they going to do about folks? 
If Folkes had just been taken in by, by Sid Ross, he was grossly incompetent. But if the truth, which we are pretty sure was worse than that, that he was using folks. I mean, well, that wasn't incompetence, that was downright dishonesty mm. and trying to um, uh, more than pervert the course of justice. It was, it was a terrible crime for a man in charge of the SIB. False evidence. He was, he was promoting false evidence so that he could get more power. And that was, that was what um, nobody in government would want to, to publicise widely in the middle of the war. We don't know what conclusion the police came to privately, but very shortly after Ross gives his confession, this story appears in the front page of the New Zealand Truth. Security police badly hoaxed by impudent jailbird. Peddling a fantastic story of his discovery of an alleged plot to assassinate two cabinet ministers, this ex-convict gained the confidence of the security police and was sent off to Rotorua to live a life of luxury in the thermal regions. Not until hundreds of pounds of public money had been spent at the instigation of this arch-imposter was the fantastic official masquerade terminated. Again, there's no evidence, but it seems the story was leaked to the truth by the police. For one thing, the story speaks glowingly of the police, particularly the alert young constable who blew wide open the scam. The SIB, on the other hand, are described as sucking at the bait with avidity. Both the Attorney General and the Police Commissioner use the story as a springboard for an official investigation and produce reports slamming Folks's incompetence. Folks asks for a leave of absence, which the Prime Minister seems to deliberately misinterpret as a letter of resignation, and he's sent back to England in disgrace. The SIB is disestablished. That role reverted to police, and James Cummings took it on. He became Commissioner in 1944 and handed it on to Jim Nalder, who continued in that role until 1956, and then the um, Security Intelligence Service was created in 1956. So it's significant to me that it's another 14 years before we get our own agency of that nature. Do you think that part of that reason for that 14-year gap is sort of this whole affair really put a bit of a, um, a, a dampener on the willingness of politicians to trust a, 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 poli- a security police? You've hit it on the head there. You really have, William. (laughs) You have done so. As for Ross, he's never prosecuted. In fact, the Commissioner of Police helps him get a cushy job as a cook for the New Zealand Army at Burnham Military Camp. Beverly Price thinks this is more evidence of a conspiracy. Obviously, he started the whole thing off and should have been, um, been put away for years and years. So why wasn't he arrested? Well, there's no information in any of the reports about why this wasn't done so you've got to got to think and the answer comes because it was right in the middle of the war if he had been tried in an open court he'd have come out with all this information about the way the SIB had behaved when they employed him as Captain Calder Uh, the, the government would not have wanted it revealed that major folks in charge of the SIB had been such a thoroughly dishonest man. So, Kenneth Folks, Incompetent fool or power-hungry liar? On one hand, I'm tempted by a saying called Hanlon's razor. Never attribute to malice that which is adequately explained by stupidity, or as it's more often put, cock up before conspiracy. On the other hand, it wouldn't be the first or the last time an intelligence agency made a mountain out of a molehill in order to give it or the government a political boost. Before the Iraq war, we had the CIA sexing up intel about weapons of mass destruction. Maybe the smoking gun evidence in the Sidney Ross case is hiding away in an archive somewhere, and we'll get a solid answer one day. But maybe the whole thing will remain a murky mystery. Coming up soon, a teaser for next week's Black Sheep. But first, special thanks to Beverly Price, Sherwood Young and Victoria University.
Make sure you subscribe to Black Sheep and give us a rating on iTunes. You can also listen on the new RNZ app. While you're there, you might want to check out another RNZ history podcast, Eyewitness, which tells remarkable stories of major historical events through the words of people who were actually there. Next week on Black Sheep... There was evidence that one of these children might have actually taken a breath. Mm. So might have been born live. So that was akin to infanticide. Black Sheep was written and presented by me, William Ray. The executive producer is Tim Watkin. This episode was engineered by William Saunders. Our voice actors were Duncan Smith and James Kane.